I'll let Andrew kind of introduce her and talk about what you guys are up to. Now yeah, I'll turn it over to you if you want to give a quick intro, a little bit about who you are and what got you into this space. My name is Andrew Strong. I work at a company called Agile Premium Finance. We do a lot of stuff in the insurance industry related. We are a subsidiary of Valley National Bank, which is a very large bank out of the New Jersey, New York area. They're all down the Eastern Seaboard and into some areas of the Southeast with retail branches. We currently or they currently actually stretch across all 50 states in terms of business and what they're doing and other things of that nature. We got into the cannabis as part of them getting into the cannabis business. And when I say cannabis, cannabis, hemp, I mean the whole sphere, all the way from your frontline retailers who are doing actual sales right there, all the way up into, you know, some of the other things that you guys are involved with and the hemp side and the industrial applications and that kind of stuff. And their model is that they wanted to get into the financial space aspect of this industry for two reasons. One, obviously there's been a lack of need for a lot of different reasons, which I'm sure everybody's aware of. <laughs> and the other, and the other is, is there's just a lot of opportunity not only starting at the top line with them, but then it filters down into like companies like ours, which we're a part of that allows us to get in and do a lot of business across a lot of different areas. So as an example, Valley does depository relationships. They have a payment management system where they can take credit cards. They can do this. They get into the things and I know we'll get a little bit more in depth, but they call it basically concierge service. And that's where subsidiaries like me come in play. So you're doing business with the bank, you have insurance, you know, you've got an insurance agent, you're doing this, we can come in and provide services both to you and to that agent inside of that space. And at this point, we're going state by state as we go through this, obviously, because we can't just do a national umbrella because the feds, of course, have their rules when it comes to banking in this space. And it allows us to go in on a state by state basis and we can start providing all these different financial services, you know, and they can run the full suite of financial services for a client. Just a lot of things that there's just an, we perceive as a need inside of this industry I and mean, just an opportunity for everybody to, you know, everybody to benefit in a good way from what everybody else can do. Sure. Okay, so I want to kind of hear about you. We before we went live, we were talking about the the benefits and the advantages and disadvantages to the pandemic and what it did to the relationship piece, right? And being able to build relationships. Can you kind of talk to me as you've gone out and you've built these relationships with clients? What are some of those nuances in the hemp industry that you're seeing that you're able to, you know, fill that gap for or really you know, we've got some work as an industry that probably need to be addressed. I would say the first one right out the box that kind of really took me by surprise yeah. was when I started to talk to different people about what we were doing and what we would like to do and services that we could provide was the immediate, this is the way we've been doing things. And a lot of it was workarounds and such that were necessary to be able to do business because you couldn't just right. walk into a bank. You couldn't just walk into an agency and get a, and get a, you know, a policy. And if your policy was a large premium policy, which is a lot of what we do, you know, it was a 50, 100, 150 million dollar policy. You couldn't just go in and go, Oh, Hey, look, we just run around with like, we'd like to finance that instead of having to just write a check for the whole thing and start the year. And that was probably the biggest thing that hit me that made me go, oh, you know, because I mean, honestly, when I when we first got started, I was like, oh, my God, like, this is a gold mine. Like, <laughs> these people have this massive need and we can fill this need and we should just be able to jump in here real quick and just go to work and money fall from the heavens and found out real quick. Work out for you. Silly <laughs> <case>. <laughs> and anybody listening. Anyone in the yeah, industry, like, I'm sure, was in the same. Nothing has happened as we all expected it. <laughs> oh, 
oh yeah. So you know, so then it was like, okay, so now we got to re. Now it was like, okay, I got to revamp my strategy a little bit here, like you know, because I don't have rebuttals for, you know, crypto and some of these other things that I heard as part of the space and the way people were moving things and doing things to make things happen. So it was like, okay. So then I had to take a step back. I was like, okay, I got to do a little bit more homework here because. I wasn't prepared for that. And part of that was, was a lot of this was as you're, you know, back to your original question of why and pandemic and this, that, and the other, all of it was over Zooms and this, that, and the other. I couldn't go sit down with somebody and spend an hour with them and pick their brain and just have a a normal conversation that you have with your friends when you go sit down at a coffee shop or whatever, which is a much more relaxed setting and people can be less defensive of, Oh, well, you're just trying to sell me something. Well, uh, I think whereas when it came in this way, it's less transaction. Yeah. When we're like this, I feel I'm so, I'm so relationship focused in sales and in building what I've built, you know, or what we're working on with the association is really about community and people and relationships and doing business with people we know and trust. And it's hard when it's, I guess it's easier removed, you know, over the phone, text message, Zoom. It's distant. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is I'm the new guy coming in and you don't know who I am. And the other part of it and another big thing that I heard a lot was, was, you know, oh, we've heard all these things before. Like You can do this and do that. And when we get started, it's not the way it's it's portrayed because then there, there, there's this roadblock and there's that roadblock and there's this roadblock. And sure. so, I mean, when, and like, again, like, you know, we're new to the new to the space. We've only been doing this for you know, since like August. So, I mean, we're really new to the space for as long as y'all, a lot of y'all have been doing this and you're deep in and you've learned a lot of lessons and everything else. For us, it's a lot of learning as you go. (laughs) I think this is a good perspective about where the industry is, the industry's needs, right? You guys as a company recognize the need and the opportunity to get involved and where that learning curve is. And so I think that there's a something to be said that the timing of when to get involved. And I think that now really is a great time and it's a great place, like you said, to to dive in and learn. <laughs> You're learning from people that have years of experience compared to two years ago getting in. You're learning by yourself also. And so there really are a lot more resources and tools. And so with that then, right, understanding some of these nuances, what are some of the real perks and benefits? Talk to me about services provided and where, where you're really able to fill those gaps. You know, where, what are some needs? Why should all of our listeners be contacting you? Well, I mean, the first thing we can do from, and I'll start from a top down approach, which is going to start with the parent company. Versus us specifically, because we're we're more of like I said, we're kind of a branch off of that. And while what we can do is a lot of different things, provide a lot of services that I'm sure most everybody who's who's on here right now is highly highly interested in the in the parent company piece. <laughs> well, and I think um, that's where this becomes right. We saw this a lot in like payments and insurances we're a piece of, and then the parent company comes in and says, Hey, we're not doing that anymore. And all of these brokers or all of these customers are lost. So you actually are connected directly to the source, to the bank. Yes. 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 We are connected directly at the top. So, I mean, you can start at the top and when you start at the top, you got to start with just normal depository relationships. So you're doing business, you need a place to park your money. You need a place to access, do those type things. And that's going to kind of be the genesis for everything else. And then once you start filtering out from that, start thinking of a lot of your just traditional banking services. And it is, I will say this, we are state by state specific in terms of which ones we're doing business with because of because of the legislative landscape that is in place currently. The way we have to do this is, is we have to go in and vet every state's laws what they have in place, what they don't have in place, what's allowed, what's not allowed, and then go through all the, the licensing and everything else. I mean, and, and you have to vet a single state to be able to do business in it and then set that up. And once that's done, you can move on to the next state and we move on to the next one and we move on to the next one and we move on to the next one. Currently, we're doing, we're 25, 26 states that are approved. They are constantly approving states. So, 
Every month or so, there's another one to two states that are added. What that allows is, is as we continue to add, now you're talking about instead of banking on a very regional basis or a very state-oriented basis, Valley now allows for you to, to, to bank on a more countrywide basis. Because once we have all these things in place, then the, some of those traditional lines that are in place from going from one area to another kind of melt away. As I guess a good metaphor for it. Give me some examples so, of what those traditional lines are, and and yeah, traditional lines are is, is so. If you look at the federal regulations, is is that you're not allowed basically to go across state lines. Absolutely. Once you do that, is you, now you get into all these because all these laws existed from years ago when everything was highly illegal and you know black and the black market and all this other stuff. So they wanted to prevent you from being able to really be mobile in the space now with some way some of the way things are working is, is those line those things are kind of melting away a little bit there's still some in place that you got to be leery of and that's what the bank does I and mean, they're very good at knowing you know you're in utah i'm in louisiana they're in new jersey so if you wanted to go if you're doing business in utah and colorado and nevada and california all those states are approved. So we can do different things and you can have multiple locations in there and be able to do all of your business within one entity versus in the past, as I have somewhat understand from what some people have told me is, you may have to bank with this bank here and bank with this bank there and bank with this bank over here because they couldn't go, you couldn't go across the triangle basically. Right. Whereas we can kind of take that, some of that away and then you can use one bank and for all of that space. You know, and then even outside the depository, once you, like I said, there is a cashless payment system. There is, you know, I, I don't want to use one particular word because I know that'll set fire to everybody. <laughs> and that is a very case by case basis, which is, you know, the hot button item is lending, you know, yeah. being able to get money and everything else. And I'm not saying that Valley doesn't do it. But I'm also not going to sit here and say that it's just a wide open market. Well, it's a and, very case you know, by case basis. That's something we've seen a lot, right? Is yes. understanding that most of the businesses that are in this industry are startups. And when yeah. money and lending happens, it's not initially or typically at the very first phase. And so we've got to get, I've actually had a number of companies, both in the financing space, lending space, you know, venture capital, who have said, you know, it's just a matter of time. And all of these companies are going to be fundable or. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. Right. And so I think that. I, I just want to give validation back is just because we have a source of lending or financing does not mean everybody qualifies or every business yeah. is in that box, especially as yeah. well as it is. Well, and that's the thing. And and I can tell you that, you know, Carolyn, who was supposed to be here from the bank yeah. to discuss a lot of this in more detail, because this is what she does day in and day out, would tell you, like, she's like, I really don't like in big settings talking about lending strictly yeah. because it can be such a a a hot button item and two you don't want to put with a very broad brush because it could be yeah. very very now but as she would uh, and i think she would say in terms of that subject in particular is that it is a service that the bank is providing in the space to clients currently there's just all you know it's just a lot of work that goes into that to see whether or not that relationship is good for everybody on both sides. Because as we know, there may be situations where the bank's like, oh yeah, we're in. And, you know, depending on everything else, the client goes, yeah, well, maybe we're not, you know, because like you said, there's other, there's other options, especially in this Absolutely. space with venture capitals and other things. So, you know, it, it's there. Well, this goes but both I mean, ways. Just because there's yes. money, there's good money and bad money, right? And there's a good exactly. fit and bad fit. And so being, yeah, I, I just, I'm with you and I really want to validate back to where the concern is, is that, you know, addressing the topic that it's something the bank is doing does not mean that it's kind of, oh, yeah, it's not just why. It's not, with no, yeah. Yeah, it's not like you're walking in and borrowing money for a car or something like that, where literally anybody's walking in and it's like, oh, yeah, and pretty much everybody, as long as you're willing to pay and you got the right collateral, which is usually the car, you can get the car. Like, if you're willing to put up the money, it's there. It, it doesn't work like that. 
But then even outside of that, like you can get into, there's a lot of other services the bank can do. There's wealth management. There's different things for the business. There's title companies. There's all these other branches, these different services that are all fall under this umbrella that once you're in and you're a client, all these other things can open up to you. So a so lot of these talk different about things. That a little bit? Talk about sure. really to the relationship piece, right? Again, I see I see so much has changed from the transaction base and the value of having a relationship with your insurance agent and your banking and lending teams, right? Talk to me, yeah, about those. What are what does open? Up? What what else? Well, what it does is is because once you start start establishing with one piece and then you establish with another and you get it, you start building this as you put it relationship with a with the financial institution and i'll just use that as the broad umbrella yeah you become much more of a your your business is much more known what you're doing how you're operating are you a good risk versus a bad risk all those things and as you branch out and there's more and more pieces there's more and more information it's the same thing as you get out on the internet and you start doing things and you start leaving digital fingerprints everywhere. Well, you can take all those digital fingerprints and put them together and you make one. And then you can kind of know more of what that person's doing and how they're operating and those type things. And that in particular is a huge piece inside of this space with what both Valley and us as agile and everybody else under the umbrella are doing, because if you're doing it with me, let's say you're just doing your premium financing with me and then you're like, oh, well, I need it. I would like to explore doing a depository relationship with Valley. Well, then you go in and Valley sees, oh, you're already doing business with them. They'll come ask us, hey, what do you know about these guys? You know, and then we can say, hey, look, they've been a great client. They never had a payment issue. It's been wonderful. And vice versa, the other way around. Like, you know, if you got another piece with, you know, with the bank. And then you're coming to us or, you know, or it's an insurance agent that specializes in, you know, the cannabis industry or the hemp industry or, or some of these different applications. If they're already doing business with the bank and the bank brings them to us, and we're like, well, what do you know about it? And they'd be like, oh, they've been unbelievable clients. You know, they've been great. We've never had an issue. Then that comes in and that allows people like us to come in and go, oh, OK, well, you, we know you're a good risk because we know that relationship's there. Instead of giving you five points on a deal, maybe we give you three. Cause you're a much more known quantity. Like there's all these different avenues where things can just start stacking on top of themselves because that baseline relationship is there. And then the ability to get into all the different services, like I said, I mean, I named off a couple. I mean, you can do wealth management, you can do title closings, you can do the lending piece is there for people who have, especially people who have these great relationships in the totality, you know, we may have a situation where like maybe I'm not necessarily doing it with a frontline insurance agent, but we have a program with an actual company who's writing the policies on this business. And that's just another piece where we can go, that may not be a direct piece, but that's another piece where we can go, Hey, you know what? We can connect you over here to this company who's in this space and we have a relationship and we think it would be a great idea for you to possibly, you know, do your insurance needs over here because we know that their product gives you this, this, and this versus what you have over here and you have this, this, and this. So there's a lot of different moving pieces that can come into play. The more that relationship is built and the deeper it gets, and it's just more doors that can open just because of the size and the depth and the breadth of what Valley can offer underneath its entire umbrella right right well and i love the idea i hear all the time well i'm looking for a local bank or i'm looking for somewhere close you know because there are a few or a handful of different banks that may have one or two locations and so it's pretty mm -hmm. yeah it's pretty cool okay so how what do people do or what would your advice be to companies to prepare for prepare themselves and or their businesses for financial services or for you know, benefits that may not be open at that basic level. You know, what, what are some things that we can really do or that you're seeing organizations skip the step on or forget about? I, I would say the biggest thing when establishing up front and you're trying to enter into a new one is going to be 
transparency. And when I say that, not necessarily anybody's hiding anything, but there's going to be a lot of questions about specifically what you're doing, how you're doing it, where are you sourcing your materials from? You know, do you have things in place to show, you know, we grew X amount of product over here and we turned it into X amount of whatever the product is you turned it into and we sold it off. Like, do, can you, can you validate your, your entire line? Because, and the reason that becomes important is because, you know, there's a white market and a black market and then there's a gray market. Everybody is kind of operating at this point a lot in the gray. It's just because you're, you're everybody, this whole industry is transitioning from being nothing but a black market in terms of the eyes of everybody. And now it's transitioning over into out of that. So you're going from black to white and white is good. Well, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of unknown and policy change that still they're like, yep. wait, we got to change this. We didn't think about it before we moved yep. it over. And yeah, now there's this yeah. like uncertainty. So, what do we do with it? Yeah. And that's the gray part. And that's yeah. where most everybody is operating at this point. Totally. So I, th- th- when I say transparency, it's because just being able to validate exactly what you're doing, how you're doing it and where you're doing it and all those type things is a massive piece that just opens up a lot because if you have, and I'll use, I'll use a dispensary as an example, because this is a great example of this. So if a dispensary comes in and wants to do a new relationship and they want to do a deposit, like they want to go the whole nine yards, they want to do depository. They want to go the whole nine yards with everything that's available. So when you start putting that in, what you have is, is can you, you know, how much product was grown, how much was in your store, how much was sold? Can you validate that you grew, uh, you know, and we'll use very easy terms here. We, you had X amount of plants, which produced a thousand pounds and we sold 1100 on out of the, what the three was, what the receipts show. Okay. Well, where'd the extra come from? Because you, you, you went from, seed here you went through the process and when you got to the end well now we're a little bit over where did the over come from and those are the type things that can be a pitfall for for newer companies coming in because can you if you can adequately explain that as to how that happened great no problem but you got to be able to validate that and those are the type things that yeah when you're going in like that's why i say transparency is just a huge piece because if something like that comes into play all of a sudden well now everybody especially in the financial industry i would assume now everybody backs up a little bit like whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute we got all this extra where did this extra come from like where is this floating in from right and that's where they start questioning and that becomes part back to the gray part because now the concern is as well is this coming from the black area instead of the white area I didn't um, and it just that. I did an interview probably a year and a half ago, and it was it was really interesting. She said, you know, it's really hard going from being expected to burn our receipts and destroy any evidence of us buying (laughs) anything to now saying everything has to be transparent in order for you to scale, grow, get a license, anything. And so it is it's a complete change of mindset, not even necessarily like on this bad to good or it's. It's like business. We, we went from yeah. a successful financial, I shouldn't say successful necessarily all the time, but a <laughs> financial or oh, revenue generating. I don't even know if it's revenue honest, generating is good. Right? Um, yeah. Business, yeah, where everything was under the table or ran with cash or stored, you know, in the garage. And so that. In a safe in the back room. Yeah, that just that mindset mm-hmm. or that transition takes time and and understanding. Yes. But I think then it goes back to, you know, general business practices. We are entering business and we're looking to scale, yep. and that's necessary. Can you talk real quick? You have mentioned multiple times different products that are available and services that are available. What are some mm-hmm. of those that may be available that people don't take advantage of or may not be aware of? Specific it, to the industry or just in general? 
I would say in general, you know. I mean, a lot of what people don't, a lot of things that can, that say people don't take advantage of is just things that they just don't understand. And, and when I say that, I mean, in terms of, they don't even know what's available to them. So like exactly. wealth management is, wealth management is a great one to talk about. So when you're inside of this and you're putting, you're parking all of your money at this, at a bank and you're doing all this and you turn around and it's like, okay, well now I'm going to go invest my money and do this and do that. Well, where am I going to do that? Well, then you turn around and you go to Edward Jones or whoever else is advertised on the television or whatever. And, and you're starting that relationship over. And a lot of people don't realize that a bank that is the size of Valley has all of these different services, all these different financial services you can think of. Like, so you're going to go buy, and I'll relate this very easily here. So you've got a relationship with, with us and you're doing all this stuff. And then you turn around and you're going to go buy another 50 acres to grow a product. Well, you're going to go close on that. There's going to be a title attorney involved and you're going to do all this work. Well, why again, are you going outside to somebody else and pay them where you probably may not even get, like you can get preferable pricing probably from us and we can provide that service for you and turn around and do that. Okay. So you got these different things that all just start melding in and you're talking about the legitimacy of business and running a business. Just start thinking about all your day to day. You know, what do you do? What's involved? I got to do this. I got to do that. And all these things that relate back to these services. So, I mean, you can just start going down the litany of chains and then it doesn't even have to relate to your business. Like I said, if you're going to go buy a car, you're going to go buy a house, you can do all that. Well, you know, why wouldn't you do those just traditional financing, financial transactions with where you're already doing all your business? So, I mean, the, the list gets very long, yeah, but I, I would say the, it goes to show, you know, that these banks or it, it, it's new also to the industry to be able to say, I can walk in and build a relationship for all of these services. Just like you said, at the yes. beginning, for all these workarounds, right? And now mm -hmm. we have the opportunity to bring it under an umbrella, similar to a building materials company or, a, a you know, a yep. general agriculture company. And so I think that, you know, that also takes time building that relationship and putting into perspective that, you know, when we're a startup industry or a startup company in a startup industry that, you know, building those relationships do take time and setting the foundation with transparency is critical for growth or success, especially as, you know, opportunities open up and new services, new rates. Oh, well, that's the thing. And the thing about the thing about, you know, somebody like Valley is, is that Valley is constantly expanding. We're getting into new spaces. We merge with this company. Well, we merge with this company. We didn't have the service before. Boom. Oh, look, all of a sudden here we, now we have this whole department that is now yeah. part that we can offer that we didn't have last month. Right. And those are the type things. And that's the, that's the beauty of that. And I mean, look, you know, you want to deposit your cash nationwide? We can do that. Like there's, we can, <laughs> we can set that up and do before. that. It's not. No, I mean, you could, you just couldn't do it. Uh, I mean, no, I get it. I mean, look, there's still, and look, there's still hurdles. That's why we have to, that's why they've been going through as we've begin, continue to develop this program specific for y'all's industry. That's why they're having to do everything state by state right now. We can't just, there's laws that are in place that won't allow us to just go, you know what, we're just going to do business in all 50 yeah. states. Boom, boom. We're open. Like, we can't do that. We have to go state by state and do this and do that. But, you know, but that's a, that's a great example. And I probably should have said that a lot earlier. You know, like, if you just want to be able to deposit your cash, <laughs> like, like, we can set it up to where you can deposit your cash. And if you're in California, no big deal. If you're in Colorado, no big deal. If you're in Florida, no big deal. Like you can deposit, we can set it up where you can deposit your cash, you know, and put your money in the bank and then use it as any traditional business would use it. Right. Think of who, whoever you want. I mean, insurance is a great example of that very traditional, been around for forever. There's no stigmas. There's no anything. Like if you want to go in and go do this, go do that. You can. And that's where this is going. And that's where it's going for you guys. I mean, it's, it's coming and it's going to continue to grow and grow and grow. 
which is why we're trying to get in now. <laughs> so we could be a little bit ahead of the curve for when the day comes when it is just wide open. Because that day will come. I mean, it is coming. Every, every day you move closer to that. We just want to provide a lot of those. We just want to provide a lot of those services now so that maybe we could be on the forefront of that for everybody, you know. Well, in reality, we, it's, it's the services or you know, like the insurance, the banking, these fundamental business needs are what the industry needs to really scale, right? When we talk about like the industry cannot grow alone on 50,000 products or 25,000 products. Somebody said the, in a meeting that day, and that's exactly right, right? We have to have the foundation that helps to mitigate risk, that understands transparency, that helps to move the money around, right? And, and mm -hmm. yeah, wealth management, because all of us that are in this blood, sweat, and tears, I know will benefit from you. <laughs> <laughs> I see all of you out there. I believe in you. Everybody who's doing this is not doing it because they think it's fun. <laughs> they may think it's fun, but at the end of the day, if it doesn't pay the bills, you don't be doing it. So, yeah. well, you there's, know. there's more passion in this industry than I've seen in any industry. It's oh, I'm sure it's been it, pretty. It's a it's an emerging right now. You're an emerging industry, so everybody who's in it mm -hmm. fully buys into it. You don't have a lot of people just coming in because it's available to them. You know, if you're if you're in it, it's because you believe because you're at the beginning, you're at the beginning stages of what will be the next, you know, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. You know, everybody who's really in it now has to have passion about it or else you're just there's too many hurt. Like you said, there's all these hurdles that have been in the way. If you don't have passion for it, you're not going to you're not going to keep jumping over hurdles. You'll just eventually the hurdle will knock you down and you'll be like, yeah, I'm done. And you'll go do something else. So you got to have that. That's that's a hundred percent relatable, and I would say expected at this point with everybody that's in the industry. Right, right. Bill has a has a question, and then I want to dive into who fits into your box on who you really want to connect with, okay. right? And what that looks like. But but in CBD, many varieties goes go many varieties go hot, causing total loss. How do you address genetic risk in CBD? Would you, would the underwriter be interested in, in underwriting industry be interested in certified seed varieties with money back guarantee, putting liability on the breeder if the crop goes hot? I mean, specific to a particular product, I can't really speak to because that's just not going to be in my wheelhouse, honestly. But what I can say that relates to this that I think, so what they do in terms of you're talking about total losses and those type things happening, there is a, we have, or Valley has a, an audit situ, whoop, situation, is a bad word, an audit process at which they do. So what they do is, is that on their clients as they're coming in, they're tracking, they're really auditing and keeping track of what the business is doing. And that that's maybe even a, it's not a say service that's provided, but it's done. So that information's there and can be provided for the client in that they're, they're looking at, you know, you planted 5,000 plants, you know, as this example that he just put up on the screen, we lost 4,500 of the plants due to, you know, he called it hot loss. Not real sure what that term is. So I don't want to speak to it. It means uh, that it went above the the federal limit of THC. Oh, so, so we're talking about the THC. Has, oh. So now the crop okay. has crossed into a marijuana classification. Yes. Or, okay. I, okay. All right. Now I'm with you. I understand that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, what they would do is is they they would track that. I mean, if it gets outside of your business model, then you, you, we're they're going to track that and they're going to know that. So you're not going to get deemed for it in terms of the financial product. Or you know the financial products in terms like rates of rates going up because there's yeah, nothing I mean, to ensure the loss, right? There's nothing to ensure that if I buy a specific seed, so I think I think that this is what Bill's talking about, right? If if we buy okay. a seed from distributor A and they have a mm -hmm. guarantee on that seed that the seed is not going to go hot, right? Now if that crop okay. goes hot and now the insurance company you know, do they insure? Is there an option to insure that? And who's responsible if that seed breeder is 
guaranteeing that the crop doesn't go hot with a money back guarantee? That would actually be specific to a particular, to that company. So yeah. you got to think about, and, and, and so I can give you some generalities on this, but I can't speak specifics because I don't, because we're not doing my company in particular, we don't do the products. Well, um, Debbie, Debbie made a good point, right? It really does depend on the carrier, the contracts. There's so many pieces yes. to this. What it's going to be is, is how good is the broker and the company themselves at, at how experienced are they in this? Did they develop a product that can appropriately handle this? And, and this is one of those things of, like you said, of things being new and your people learning and everything else. What I would tell you is, is that that is something that be that is a hot button item in the industry right. that can happen. The more that the insurance industry itself develops into this, and I mean, look, there's there's brokerage firms and stuff now that I know of that are specific to cannabis, and they're getting in, they're creating products. What I would tell you is, is that that's a, the more that need exists, those products will be developed and will come online. Like well, they will be there. I'm just going to put this out. I'm a little bit concerned about capping, especially cornering on the financial market. Also, the point three, especially when we're looking at a fiber or grain crop that the THC level doesn't matter. That product's left in the field during redding. And so I am a little bit concerned about cornering our market on percent when it's not for a consumable product. I, I don't know. I don't know enough about the industry to say yeah. that I know where that came from. What I would tell everybody on here <laughs> is that is that is all the way at the federal level. Of course, that, yeah. That, that percentage yeah. is there. You talk to it, but every it's time also you talk being negotiated. I mean, there are bills being presented that would change yes. that regulation or the testing requirements for a fiber and grain production versus a cannabinoid production, right? And so, but that's what it's going to take. Like uh, those, are the, yeah. that's what it's going to take to to melt some of that away to make those things go away. Because the way the the way the federal government has everything set up, and I'm sure you you all are highly highly more versed on this than I am. But I yeah. just know from what we do, like, because look. And what we do with when we're doing different products, whether it's hemp versus cannabis, whether it's a dispensary versus an industrial application, like that that 3.5, that is the magic line, even for what we're doing. And that changes the rules. And not that we won't do business on both sides of the line, but it changes how we do business, whether you're on underneath well, that line or whether you're over it. I mean, but again, right, if that testing requirement is no longer needed, right, if, if, a, if I walk out to a field and I know this crop is being grown for building materials or a fiber crop or grain crop, mm -hmm. and I no longer test that THC level, that now changes policy also. In, in oh, industry, absolutely. Right. And so that then everything. opens up. Yeah. And this goes back to like regulating grapes before it becomes wine or hops before mm -hmm. it becomes beer. Right. These are agriculture crops. Yep. Now, once I'm taking it to a consumable. So there are there's a couple of different policies being proposed or bills being proposed. One really pushing for the point three, you know, in certified seed and one for you know that visual test or that sight test to open the market for fiber and green. So yeah, I'm, I mean, they, I'm interested as those things and those changes happen around the farm bill, how it really does allow for better insurance policies and better financial services because it puts that separation and takes it out of this gray area mm -hmm. where we can identify where the products are going. Yeah. Well, and like I said, I mean, we can operate on both sides of the line, like, like we can be on either side. So if you... Now, what we do is more the financially driven aspect of it, not the actual insurance product. Right, right. So the insurance products, the way that they're written, they're always written with a set of circumstances in mind. This is any insurance product, whether it doesn't matter what it is. Right. And what you see is, is when it's circumstances that they were originally developed for are either no longer adequate or they change, that's when the products start to change. So 
that's there's so many variables like you're talking about like you know if any of these bills that you're talking about if any of them make it through and change the rules then the products can adjust to that so there's only an x number of players in the insurance that are true companies that are playing in the industry right now it's not wide like you're not going to get and very limited there's a lot of great get a yeah, you're not going to get travelers is not going to come in and just full bore open like they are in other industries or a chub or some of these massive companies that could more than easily any day of the week if they wanted to handle anything and everything y'all want like, because they're just that big. That's they're just titans in the industry. You know, they're just but they're not going to do it because of everything, the way everything's in place right now. So yeah. you're stuck with more specialty companies that are have the you know kind of like you guys that kind of have the passion and see the goals and are in the space so they're trying to operate but they're still they're cutting their teeth a little in bit. It. yeah they're cutting, yeah, they're their, cutting teeth their teeth in. same as same as everybody same as us as everybody else like you're getting in you're learning what works what i would tell you is is that as you going back to that whole relationship part that you were talking about yeah. As the relationships get more and more built inside the industry, the ability to solve issues like what was just asked up front mm -hmm. becomes easier to fix. Totally. It's just one of those things of, you know, and I don't want to say it because I'm sure y'all heard it a bunch and it probably drives you nuts. It just takes time. <laughs> uh, we don't want to hear know? that. You know, we're out of time. This is what I keep hearing, right? Is the people that are so passionate. What once you kind of learn a little bit about what hemp does, it's hard to turn your back on it. And so it's interesting. Oh, look, uh, the amount I've learned in the last six months has been mind boggling. It's pretty like, cool. Things that I've seen like hemp concrete and hemp this and hemp that yeah. and the, all these different things. And I'm sitting there going, yeah, I didn't even know that existed six months ago because yeah. I didn't. I had no idea. No clue. Oh, there's Every day there's something that comes up and I'm like, wait, what? They're doing what with this? That's actually yeah, uh, It's pretty cool. Yeah. So, so I want to jump in real quick. Who, who fits inside your perfect box? You know, who, who can GHA and our network help connect you with? Uh, I mean, for me specifically, for my subsidiary and what we do, yeah. companies, like actual companies. So like there's and companies, a couple of small startup. X number of employees, number of revenue. Who fits in that? What size of company? Uh, that, the gambit can run the, like, because look, I have done stuff. I did stuff. Now, another industry, but they were doing, as an example, they brought a new product to market to deal with hail coverage. And this product was tied to a new piece of technology. And they targeted it a lot at car dealerships. And what it did was, so traditionally in the entrance, just so that everybody kind of understands. So traditionally, you would have different coverages in place. You'd have all these cars on a lot. You get a hailstorm. It dents all the cars. You got to have somebody go out. We got to assess this claim. How much is there? Yada, yada, yada. You go through it. It takes time. Well, what these guys developed is they developed a piece of technology that could be at the dealership that basically in real time, could A, detect the hail, could tell them how big the hail was, how much of the lot was affected by the hail, and they could process their claim to get all this fixed for the insurance done in a matter of days versus it taking weeks or sometimes months, depending. So they were a startup. This was a startup deal. They had been operational for less than a year when they came to me. And what we did was, was we put a thing in place to where as they were writing these insurance products for all their clients, they could do a financial piece to it to finance it out and could even finance out a piece of the equipment, the equipment, whereas before, no matter what, you had to write a check up front for the piece of equipment. There was no questions asked. Mm -hmm. So like it can be something new and innovative, like if somebody's developing a new product or something like that, we can do that. If they get into, and this is an insurance and financial term, but if somebody creates a captive for hemp growers and they want to do it, we do a ton of business inside the captive industry, just in general. 
Well, that's a topic Um, that comes up quite a bit, right? Especially as you get groups that are trying to mitigate risk or co-op large large organizations that are trying to scale and move and, you know, take advantage of, yeah, different pieces of it. So that's something else that I'd be interested in talking a little bit more about because I think it's something the industry, I, I, I don't think, I've heard multiple people in the industry call on that product. Well, it's a way, that is a solution when traditional products are not there for you, either just availability or cost or other things, th- that is a that is a vehicle that you can do. I don't want to say as a workaround because it's not. It's its own animal. It's its own actual insurance product. But a captive is a way to mitigate some of these different roadblocks that are in in the way. And it allows a group, you know, so you can get all like as in, we'll use hemp growers as a great as an example. So you get all these hemp growers together and they're all on board to do this and you get a company to come in and you get the financial piece that comes in with us. And then you got everybody else and you put all this together and you create you just create a situation where now you can insure your products for, against these losses and these different things and they exist. We, we do all kinds of captives in a lot of different industries, do a lot of it. So that's a product that if somebody's interested in, we can have conversations about it. And that could be as somebody who's already an established captive and wants to do certain pieces, or it could be somebody who's wanting to do a new captive. You know, we can do that. And there again, to branch out into the, the breadth of what we can do, if it's a new captive, there's a lot of times depository situations that you want to put in place for a brand new captive to set things up so it's just financially feasible. Again, we can do all that back with the bank and then link it all back to us and put it all together. So instead of having to deal with multiple people when you're putting your captive together, well, now you can deal with one person for the financial aspect of it and we just do it all for you from top, top to bottom, everything that has to be done to put one of those together. So the, so captives is another piece. If you're an insurance agent that's just out there and you just have a bunch of clients. I mean, the insurance agent piece is really the kind of, kind of our bread and butter in terms of what we do. And that, that's the majority of our clients are normally insurance agents and agencies. So if you're in that space and you need an option to be able to do financing because you're targeted, you know, all these dispensaries. And you're, you're, you have an insurance product and you're running all this business. We can come in and again, do the financing piece associated with that. Mm-hmm. And I mean, we can go all the way down to the insured. Look, if you got somebody who's needs an insurance product, what up? We can make, we can make an introduction to the insurance piece, you know, and put, I'll see it. Well, yes, it is. It's not done for me. I'll lose. Uh, I see this comment down here. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm reading it right now. It's no, like you're, yeah, I was just bringing it up because I was going to address this, that I think this is something to bring up, that if they're not set up and structured correctly, you know, the disadvantage. And so really utilizing companies and organizations that have experience. Oh, yeah. No, if you set a captive up incorrectly, like the amount of money you could lose, the right. the... the <laughs> It could be bad because <laughs> yeah. the yeah. worst, what you don't want to have happen if you do a captive is have the captive go under Yeah. because if the captive becomes insolvent, then you, not only is there no protection for anybody, which is the whole point of the captive, you lose all the money that was used when it was set up. So if it becomes insolvent, it just, right. you know, everybody put a dollar in it. When it comes back out, you're getting, instead of getting your dollar back, you get 10 cents. So you've lost everything else. So now you're even further behind able. Not only did you lose on the front end, you lose on the back end. So yeah, if you you got to be captives if they're not set up and run correctly, can be a way to really go the wrong way down the road. <laughs> it could set well, you back a a pretty good bit. Andrew, how do people get in touch with you if they want to reach out and dive in later on? Uh, well, I'm actually uh, I'm actually. On the Global Hemp Association, and we are a member. Yes, it uh, is. So all all of my information is available there. My phone number, my email, anything. Awesome. So I mean, if you've got questions about particular things, and it can be different pieces. And look, 
if it's more in all honesty if it's more into the banking aspect of it like that's really what you want to get into and yeah but uh but yeah no i mean i can refer you over to and if there's any particular piece like just one piece of the financial aspect that you're interested in you know we can refer you to that what about overseas, what about overseas? emerging cannabis economies like ecuador hi paul that's good that's going to be a banking piece. <laughs> Not going to sit here and say 100% that that is 100% yes or 100% no. I would say that that's going to depend on a, I mean, Ecuador is very specific, but I would say that depends on where you're going. Does my parent company bank internationally? Yes, they do. Do they bank internationally within the cannabis space? I don't know the answer to that. My guess is, is that it would be one of those we need to have some discussions questions <laughs> and get all the policy right there's a lot yeah, of get, policy in these countries yeah and and see about that so it's one of those things i would say is i don't know also understand too that that may be something that like i said we've only been at we personally my com my branch my subsidiary has only been at this for about six seven months the bank's been at it a little bit longer but they haven't been in, it's not like they've been in this space for years, like five, 10 years already. So there may be some things that they'll tell you is, is that, yes, we want to get into that. However, we're not there yet. We're moving in that direction. But there again, like that, unfortunately, that would have been a perfect question to have Carolina. <laughs> she would have been able to probably answer that very succinctly, very quickly versus me who i because I'm a subsidiary, I, I know enough to be dangerous, but not enough to be an expert. So that's where you need to be, right? Is you focus on what you're good at and then linking yeah. arms with those that are in other, yeah, other sectors or other services or products. And it's always yeah. funny to me so, when the word product is used for banking. Like I never imagined insurance as a product. Obviously it is, but every time oh, you yeah, say like, product, I think like, textiles and oh, fabrics and clothing. <laughs> like, like for most people with insurance, just insurance in general, that's the biggest thing because it, while it is a product, it is very much a intangible product versus tangible. And that's sure. the hardest thing for people to fully get their mind around a lot of times is that you pay all this money, but I don't have... I didn't go to Target and spend 50 bucks and come home with either these groceries or these clothes or these electronics or anything else. I went to the, you know, whoever and spent a thousand dollars and I came home with at most a piece of paper, <laughs> which they're not even doing that anymore. Now everything's going so digital that it's all being emailed and everything else these days. So, but, but yeah, but no, if there's questions like that, like, like Paul in particular, if that's something you really wanted to, if you get with me, I can get you connected to Caroline and you two can have a conversation about that. And she can tell you, yes, we can do that right up front or no, we can't. Aaron had a question. Should the industry be looking at the hot crop issue from the client or buyer perspective? Compliance to the Delta 9 THCA requirements is an essential piece of risk management risk management because the buyers cannot associate with the legal op illegal operators the same way as palm oil industry has to be mindful mm -hmm. of deforestation and then or the down industry has to ensure that their supply is not associated with bs grass forest grass i think this I is a good thing to think about right is on the I wouldn't put it, in all honesty, I wouldn't put it on necessarily try to 100% lay it at one person's foot versus the other and sure. be on, on either side. I think both sides are going to have to be mindful of that, especially with the way things are currently. Yeah. From well, and again, this separates, this goes back to that, like really the, the test compliance side of what is that end product going into and us being able to figure out, listen, if I'm selling into a, hemp building block or a, a roofing tile, my yeah. test requirements should not be the same. <laughs> but in your current environment, I, I mean, I would say, I, in all honesty, I would say you'd want to do it. You, I'm always big for covering all your bases. And if you're going to do that, I'd say it needs to fall at both sides. Because, yeah, just because if you write a product that is one-sided, 
there, or if there is a product that is one sided because it is designed to help the let's just say the buyer. We'll use that one as first. If it's designed to help the buyer, then that product will be specifically marketed to that segment of the industry. Sure. Uh, and that product will not help at all on the other side with the grower. It just won't like they that will be just basically like anything else that's not usable for them at this point in time. Sure. So when you're when you're developing these things out, you have to keep in mind of specifically what is the exact issue we're trying to solve so your issue has two sides to the coin so honestly you're gonna have you need a product that handles both sides that either the product is designed to handle both sides which most of the time unless you are specifically doing the growing and you're doing the buying which i would assume is not Typical, well, I don't know. Maybe this early in the maybe this early in the early industry, on, maybe maybe, maybe yeah. but it's not typically. But generally, you're going to go to one side or the other. So you're going to want your product to be specific to which side you're going to be on. So really, what has to happen is you have to have two separate products that get developed, one for each policies, side. and then right? that Rich. yeah policies, yeah, yeah, yeah policies, and that can actually happen at the same exact time because sometimes when you go in, a company goes in and they're trying to solve an issue. They go, and here's a great example of one. So you're, you're going to build a house. I'm going to build a house, and obviously i got to have homeowner's insurance. Keep this real simple that everybody can understand. So as the house is being built, you can't put a homeowner's policy on, even though it is a home, and that is right. where we are going. That's what it's going to be. It's being built. It's going to be my house. I'm going to move into it. I'm going to live there. When it's being built, you can't put a homeowner's policy. You have to put a builder's risk policy on. And that covers the time in which that it is being built until the certificate of occupancy is done and the home is occupied. Then the builder's risk policy goes away and now you have a homeowner's policy. I know this is not exactly, this is, yeah. So it's kind of the same scenario with this. You need a policy that is in place for the growing aspect up until the buy. And then you need a policy that's in place for the other side for the buy so that you're there so that you're putting in place. And those Same two policies time. basically talk to each other to to balance yep. what expectations are for the policy at which like what the parameters are, right? Exactly. That's okay, so they, they work. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go. They I was gonna say the one. policies are the policies are designed. They're two separate products but they're designed to get you from point A all the way to point B and understanding that as you go from point A to point B, there's various changes that are going to happen and you have to have more than one thing to address those changes. Sure. Basically. Okay. So one more thing. Okay. No, <laughs> from your perspective, right. And from your experience and where you sit in this industry, I've heard multiple times, processors and companies that are utilizing hemp say we're struggling to get farmers to grow this year because like it or not, they're growing for insurance. How do we bridge this gap on the hemp side to meet or compete with these other traditional crops that are heavily subsidized or insured for any loss, right? What do we do? I will tell you the first thing that has to happen, in my opinion, because of the way crop insurance and all that kind of stuff works, especially with the federal government and everything else. Yeah. The first thing that has to happen is, is that some of the stigmatism around the product and those things kind of have to wash away a little bit because what you want it like, so if hemp all of a sudden solves the issue of, and I'll, I'll relate this to the building industry right now. So the building industry right now, you're trying to build a house. If anybody's actually trying to do it, you understand it's a, this, because of the supply chain issues and everything else, it is an absolute disaster. So if all of a sudden you had a hemp product was an essential building piece to building homes in the United States of America, and it was just broadly used across the board, you would find that very, very quickly, especially People if it's grown to mess. Well, it, uh, if it was grown domestically, where it's not, you're not worried about it coming in from China or some of these other areas of the world, 
you would find very quickly that the federal government would all of a sudden all these things where y'all are fighting and fighting and fighting, it would be they would want to put regulations in place to protect that because it's become such a backbone of the economy. So I think the first part of your answer is, is that it's got to be recognized all these industrial applications for hemp and all these other things that they get on that level, that they get to this level of like, oh my God, this is an essential product because it can solve this issue. It can fix this. It can replace this, that we have this problem getting out of, you know, Africa or wherever else, like, once those things start happening, and that's really just cognitive reg- recognition more than anything else. It's not anything specific that has to happen. It's just the cognitive recognition of understanding that it can work like that. A lot of these other things just will all of a sudden just just be pushed over to the side. And there will be federal crop insurance place that's in place for it. There'll be crop insurance just in general from the industry, like the private industry will be in place for it. And everything else and it'll all just it'll be like a magic wand was waved and it's gone and some of that is is just you guys continuing to do what you're doing where you're educating and you're showing and you're developing that's going to be the fastest because like let's just be honest i mean and you guys i'm sure are very much aware of this the general public and i was the general public six months ago has no clue the industrial applications of hemp fibers and these other things. I didn't. Like I heard hemp, and to be honest, is as you you think of it, the general public thinks of it as yeah, they think of it as oh, we're growing marijuana. Like they, they don't. Yeah, they don't. They don't grasp. But but that's also because that's just the way everybody's been programmed for the last however many years. And marijuana was in the drug war. Listen, that the has gone on madness. in this country. Reefer Madness campaign was well thought out and planned. <laughs> they did a <Yes>. good job. <laughs> yeah. So some of that is, is you're fighting against what's been going on for the last, you know, decades. So to get past that, and I mean, you guys know this, you're doing it every day. Mm-hmm. To get past that is a hurdle. And eventually at some point, the hurdle will be overcome. And when that happens, the floodgates will open. And there'll yes. be all this. So... I mean, well, I'm going to stand at the rooftops and tell everybody about it because <laughs> get in line. It's coming. It's not going away. Like That's what's so yeah. exciting well, is we have this opportunity so, to make change. And- yeah. So, I mean, in terms of, of the, 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 I, I would say that you're, you're going to be able to find niche products right now that solve your, your issue. And like there are companies, like I said, uh, there are companies and we, we work with some of them currently that are specific for they're they're wanting to do these different things inside the cannabis industry or the hemp industry whichever side you want to be on but they're 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 walking in the space they're not running it's not like you know i mean just pick any other insurance product i mean it's just you know those things you can have rapid changes depending on the environment i mean you can have this happen this fall and by the spring there's a there's a solution in place because Somebody recognizes it as an opportunity and yeah, they, they, oh, yeah, they change policies. You can change policies now monthly if you want to. Like things have gotten that, that cycle has gotten so compressed. Things can change very, very, very rapidly. So it's just a matter of, it's just a matter of time. And I know you guys don't like hearing that, but. (laughs) I mean, I hear you, but I just don't listen. I, I, oh, I mean, I went in one ear, not the other, because <laughs> we're fixing the plane while it's flying. So, yeah, yes. but I, I'm with you and I, I agree with you that some of this, you know, as as the demand opens up and the awareness opens up and education about the differences and what they're being used for, it just it takes time. And so I'm going to push back or go back to really where GHA and these associations have so much value is linking arms to communicate and to educate and and same back to you and any of our listeners talk about him talk about what you see if there's anything on this interview or any of our other interviews that you found share them so more people see them and more people have this aha moment or awakening <laughs> moment to these opportunities um and not just for what hemp does right but for 
the financial opportunity that we have and get to take and be a part of or benefit to our business to shrink that supply chain and increase profit margins. And, I mean, it really is sustainable and profitable. They look, the first people who got into, I mean, think about it like this. Jeff Bezos started Amazon in his garage. He's now the richest person on the planet. Yeah. And he's, he literally started in his garage. Yeah. I mean, so it well, starts like somewhere. Facebook. All these yep, guys, same, right? But, same yes. thing. It's it's all the same. Like if you're the first one in the door and you create a solution and it is marketable, the yeah, the financial opportunities are just they, I had there. An, advisor, an advisor tell me, he tells me often, money follows value, always has, always will. Right. And so yep. if we are providing value, the financials always follow. And so, um, you know, keeping that in mind that doing things right. And, and then I go back also, I want to wrap this up real quick to doing P doing business with people that have experience and have been in this industry and have, have a, a bank behind them. <laughs> you know, when you look at who are we doing processing with or who are we working directly with, mm -hmm. it says a lot when you look at the team involved and the partners involved. And so when we look at, you know, growing from the black market to this, I just use that because, well, I just use that example because it's the easiest for everybody to relate to. If you go black to white, well, in between there's the gray, so you can cover all the basis of everything that's going on within the industry. <laughs> Not that black's bad and white is good, right? You know, right. it could be you could flip it around if you want to. It doesn't matter. Just that's just well, but, you know the example. But if I'm looking for funding and I don't have transparency of where my money's coming and going right and that's more what i'm talking about is this transition yeah that's a problem into you know healthy business practices successful business practices and i think that's more where you know linking up and and evaluating all of these other aspects it's one thing to talk about the plant or the farming or the skill of doing it it's another thing to scale it and bring it into real business and so this is where yeah. you guys become such a value add to organizations and companies and so Andrew, anything else before we sign off? No, just, I mean, if you guys got any, like I said, if anybody's got any questions, you know, if it's, you, you can, like I said, I, I'm on the Global Hemp Association, so all my information's there. Call me, email yeah. me. And if it's, a, if it's a subject matter that is not specific to what my company specific does, but it is something my parent company does, like I said, I can put you in, put you in touch with whoever you, we need to get you in touch with. That's not a problem. So I love it. We love can it, do that. It. Okay, well, thank you again to all of our um, sponsors. I'm going to give them a real quick shout out again before we log off. South Bend Industrial Hemp is doing an incredible job leading the charge um, with the fiber variety trials. So follow her, make sure that you're following along there. Prairie Band Ag, IND Hemp, of course, has done a great job to support us. Let's Talk Hemp, West Town Bank has also been an incredible supporter. So we need to talk to you guys, Andrew, about Valley Bank also getting involved because they're, they're on top. <laughs> of the AgriLead and Elmco. So thank you guys all for your sponsorships. If you guys need questions or have questions and need to get in touch with any of our sponsors, members, advisors, shout out to me or reach out to me. Other than that, Andrew, thank you very much. Tell Caroline we missed her. We'll see you next time. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the time. Absolutely. We'll talk soon. Have a good day, everyone.